Surely no hand goes up, so it just shows you know, how far this thing actually went. But I think it's important just to, to, to recall that this report is really the mother of all these reports you saw going by in a few seconds there uh, on agriculture and, and the need basically to do uh, something different if you look forward. It's also important is that we had 400 people writing. And now this is not something which only a few people wrote uh, being paid as consultant, but this was actually a, a global operation which uh, took four years to, to do. Um, it was multidisciplinary. Uh, again, we had a, a, a global report, the big, big book, and then five sub-globals. I apologize because something happens here with the... The size of the slide. So, but anyway, so this report, I think, is still very much something which, which is uh, um, the on order of the day and needs to be implemented. What happened actually is that many people took on this report and started to dilute it, starting by the British government, who didn't like certain things in that FAO, and many others. And so there, there's a lot of water in that wine, which used to be good. Um, and I think we need to really bring forward again because uh, a lot of work went into this and I think it is necessary to go back to it. I call it the IPCC for agriculture. Although we did only one, I think we hope to maybe do a few more and that's what I'm talking about right now also. So we decided, you know, 10 years later because it was commissioned in Johannesburg 2002 that 10 years later maybe somebody wants to discuss uh, what happened. You know, people spend $12 million cash and $3 million in kind to get this report done. This is no peanuts. And usually in the international uh, activities, there is sort of an accountability which uh, would need to be uh, brought forward. But nobody actually asked a single question ever. All the people who paid this money basically were happy to see the whole thing disappear. Uh, and why? It's because the Americans, the Canadians, and the Australians in particular were not very happy with it. And same like FAO, who was actually one of the co-sponsors. And why? It's because we took a line on trade where we said that free trade doesn't really work in agriculture. And then we also asked, what free trade? And um, the, the other one was on, on bad technology, where we took the line also, a very strong line saying that we don't know if it's any good or bad, but we need a whole lot more research before using any of that stuff. We don't know anything about the environmental uh, consequences. We don't know absolutely nothing about the human uh, uh, health issues and also about the social and economic uh, uh, part of it. So, <clears throat> you know, you don't put something out there which you cannot recall uh, without knowing more about it. But uh, again, as you all know, that didn't happen either. Uh, people just went all right, like a bunch of cowboys. I'm sure where they come from, it's cowboy land, uh, at least partly. So you understand why. Oh, sorry. So what we did, uh, so we, a group of 170 NGOs got together. And we decided that, because NGO world also tried to push it. But the politicians and many, many countries uh, didn't want to hear about it. And no why is because governments are very much under control of somebody else, right, as you all know. So the, the private sector and probably the multinationals control a lot of the politics. And so the NGO said, no, we don't let this happen. We want to Rio with a document, time to act. They said, now it is time to implement the uh, findings of this report. And what happened then is that all this hard work for almost two years uh, of so many people actually yielded something very interesting. And I don't know if you have read The Future We Want. There's something like 800 words uh, for agriculture and food system in this declaration, which is not bad at all. You know, given that in the past it was very little. And so in paragraph 111, and you can Google that, there was it's a fairly long paragraph where it really says that we need to change. We wanted the word transformation. It just says uh, more sustainable agriculture, but we are happy with that. And again, the definition was given before, so you see what that means. And that's certainly not, I think, the trend uh, which you can see actually in many, many places today still. And what is read there is actually quite important because right now, as you know, agriculture actually is shooting itself on the foot, which would be sort of not too bad, you know, and, but actually in the head because we, we, we make agriculture for the future impossible the way we do agriculture today. But paragraph 115 is more important even because it puts this committee on world food the Committee on World Food Security on top of and gives the responsibility to follow up on the IASD report. 
And it was done in a way so we never used the acronym because if we had used the acronym in any of, of our discussion, it would have been just shut down because you know, people don't remember much about what's in the report, but they say IISTD, and this is a red flag. Um, so we basically talked about assessments, and one of the recommendations, which I thought was some, one of the, the most important ones, was that every country should do a national assessment of its agriculture and food system. As of today, I'm still waiting to see anyone, any country actually doing such a, a detailed assessment as we did at the global level and the regional level, because no minister of agriculture will make policies in a country based on a global or regional report, right? It has to fit whatever happens in that particular country. So now we actually managed to put into the writing there of this declaration that the CFS should actually provide guidelines to help countries do their national assessment. So, I, so the process is actually continuing, and three countries, and I'll talk about this later, toward the end, uh, are, have started to do this uh, with the help of a number of organizations, in particular the Biovision Foundation and the Millennium Institute, which, of both of which uh, I'm sort of in charge of. Um, so why sustainable food systems? Well, because never mind that we still, you know, all this green evolution, all the food we have, we still have 850 million or so people which are actually undernourished. And not a minute that these are people who have a whole 12 months not enough to eat. All the ones who have only 11 months not enough to eat are not in this uh, statistics. And as we know, the seasonality of food production in many places means that there's a whole lot more people who actually suffer from uh, uh, undernourishment. Then we obviously we have the, the alternative side, the middle side, the, the obese, and, and even worse actually in terms of growing is the diabetes type 2 cases which are exploding also in developing countries. And this has everything to do with food, what we grow, how we grow it, and, and how we eat. So we have this huge health problem which has bankrupted or is bankrupting many, many countries already because they can't cope with the costs of health. And half of these costs, most of the places, are due to what we eat and also how we eat it and how it's produced. Then we have this problem with industrial production. And also, I was referring to, for I saw in this magazine, you know, I mean, the, the limits, I think, on how much energy you put into a system and how much you get out. And the type of agriculture which has been promoted almost all over the place, even today by Bill Gates and company, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, is actually an agriculture which is bankrupt from day one. You cannot spend more than you actually get, right? I mean, no matter if it's money, calories, or anything else. And so here we have really a system which really needs to be overhauled uh, uh, dramatically, knowing that sustainable or conservation agriculture practices, uh, organic and, and the like, will produce between 3 and 30 for any one calorie into the system. Because we all know we have the sun out there, we have water and, and, and the CO2, right? So that actually ends up into a positive number of calories. But so what I'm saying here is that we use 10 calories of fossil non-renewable energy to produce one calorie of basically an empty calorie. Our new varieties of crops, most of them actually are devoid of nutrients. That we increase the starch and the rest stay put. And so that's why we have all these health problems. So we really need to think harder what we do here. Soil degradation is still going on. And I must be I'm quite flabbergasted to see that in this country, like well, more than half the land right now is plowed and open. Um, I don't know, maybe that's the way you do things here, but I thought, you know, we are further advanced in terms of uh, fi figuring ways of, of maintaining our carbon in the soil, because that way here, I think it really goes up in the air quite fast. Uh, but again, there may be reasons, good reasons to do so. Still, I, I want maybe the research will prove something or find something different to do. So soil degradation is really a big, big issue, natural resource, and they will be losing biodiversity. Um, so that are big, big issues. And then again, we have the other big problem is jobs. The world has more than 1.5 billion people who are not fully employed. And now we're going to say that we need an agriculture which could employ people. We should even have fewer people working there and more people in cities doing nothing. You know, I think this is not the way the future will look like or should look like. So how are we going to do then? And I said we need to create more and better jobs in agriculture. That is linked to better food prices. Uh, that is linked to better and more appropriate mechanization. And a lot of changes in the way we do actually our agriculture on a global scale. Not only north, south, but it's also east, west, everything, everywhere. 
And so you, we know that uh, because of the type of agriculture, green evolution, we have done a lot of harm to our environment. And this is actually uh, homegrown information here uh, for, by Rockstrom. Uh, you all know it, we are actually surpassing or going beyond planetary boundaries in many areas. And how long can you spend more than you actually can regenerate? Again, there are limits there. And when we know that we have lost 75% uh, of our biodiversity in the last 50 years, I think we have to start to think about what we are doing. Um, also the nitrogen, you know, why, why do we actually uh, produce nitrogen, put in the soil when the plants can do it? And the production can be the same. So again, you know, we, we know all these things and we continue uh, uh, to this. And the climate change issue, again, I mentioned this before, agriculture will suffer most from its own uh, 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 damages. And the big deal here is that we produce twice as much as we need today. All these stories out there, oh, we need to produce double as much or even maybe 75%, 70% by 2050 to nourish the 29 billion people. This is all stories made up by a number of people. FAO now has actually come back to this, and they don't say this anymore. Although they wrote it still last year, you hear the Director General now, and finally they agree that the problem is not to produce more. The issue is to produce something different, which is nourish the people, as not feed them like animals, something which actually is grown in the right way, in the right place, by the right people. We don't need more grow more in Europe. We don't need to grow more in America. Actually, we should grow less. The more we grow here, the more problem they have in the South. Because here, agriculture is subsidized. It is unfairly come on the market and actually ruins the lives of million, mil, uh, millions of people. So I think we have to start to think about the consequence, not only of what's going on here, but in the rest of the world. It is not the role of Europe or America to feed the world. That we produce some more for places where there's conflict, there's a drought, that's one thing. But to actually start to assist them, like it's actually operating today, uh, where there's so much stuff coming on the market which is actually ruining the lives of rest people as, elsewhere in the world is no longer acceptable. And when, no, not the least, when we produce 4,600 calories per person per day alive on this planet. And that's why it's so cheap. That's why we can throw away 40% in, in, uh, in developed countries. And you all know there's so much discussion on food waste. And why we waste it? Because it's cheap. So again, I think we have to re rethink that system. What does it mean to be sustainable? I think that's, that's really, I, I think the job we have to do. And if you look in, in, in the uh, um, developing countries, people don't throw away food, it's too expensive for them already. But we lose a lot between, well, basically from the time you, the, the, the crops grow or the animals uh, uh, develop until it gets even to the market. And I think these are things we need to think harder about. So the challenge and the solution for the transformation. All right, business as usual is not an option. Think about this, business as usual. And what does business as usual mean? It means sort of more of this green evolution type uh, 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 agriculture, which is based on inputs, on external inputs of non-renewable natural resources. Agriculture is the world's largest land user. So, yes, and we have to protect it. Sustainability, we have to leave the land in better condition for the next generation, not worse. So at every growing cycle, you should have a better soil and not a worse one. And this naturally, not with then going to put some fertilizer in there or something. No, I think we can do it different. We know how to do it already. The world is full of smallholder farmers or family farms. We have to make sure that they can keep their, their land. So land ownership, uh, access to land is also a very big issue. I don't know here if any of your own people who are not from a farming family, could you go out there and buy a farm these days? In my own country, Switzerland, it is impossible. There's no way you can make enough money on that land even to pay the interest, never mind, I even pay off the capital. Something is really wrong in that system, right? And when you look at sustainable agriculture, we have to look at the three main dimensions of uh, uh, devel or sustainable development, the economic, the social, and environmental, and actually, the order is actually reverse. First is the environment, and then we have the society, and then the economy. So that's how actually we should put it to, to make sure we have understood it. 
The report actually also mentioned about multifunctionality of agriculture. This is a very big deal, and some countries did not even come to the final plenary because we had this picture in the report. Because they don't want this to be an unknown or, or, or to become a trade issue that if somebody, let's say we accept that, that agriculture has to be multifunctional and that you actually can recognize these products come from a system which links up the different elements, that this will be seen as a trade barrier. And one example is Argentina, for example. And you know what they do down there, right? So just to say that, you know, we make sure that the environment, the, the social aspects, and, and again, the economics have to work together. And that the confine, where they come together, really, we can have a sustainable food production. Now we need to transform. So what does that mean? We need to move from where we are, and that's actually, it doesn't matter where we are in the world. The systems we have today, again, with experimental, and some, some are actually pretty good, but it's not the majority, it's the minority, you know. But when you have 5 or 10% of your land in, in sustainable agricultural practices, that's not good enough. So we have to move, oh, I think there's something here. Yeah. So we have to move from this sort of productive, but unsustainable, over into an area which is actually sustainable, but also productive. So basically agroecological type of agriculture. So we have to move. Even the ones we have here in this area, which are sort of in the middle of sustainable and productive, they all have to move up into this zone of the multifunctional agriculture. And that's where sustainability will be found. And, uh, you know, so, so that movement, and that movement actually needs input. You need money to, to do the transformation because it is changing maybe the machinery use. And many, many big farms where they do now more and more conservation agriculture without herbicide, they need a whole bunch of new equipment, machines to actually handle this uh, transformation. Because you cannot use your regular machines when you have to uh, saw in, into thick, thick uh, uh, um, uh, carpet of uh, organic matter, for example. So, so this really means that we have to move all the system up here. But, but, there's a big but here, is we need to include the consumer, because farmers in the end will produce what people want to eat. And also they will produce in function of what people are ready to pay. And so we are in this sort of quagmire of system, so that we, we, unless we really also deal with the, what are people actually eating, or what is the food pyramid look like? Are we eating more meat, more dairy, or are we starting to eat more vegetables and fruit and nuts? Uh, so that depends a lot what the demand is. And if the demand is for the wrong thing, food products which have a high footprint, and, uh, and then people in addition, they, want, you know, they think there's a God-given right for cheap food, uh, that's exactly where we land, is in the wrong place, and we land over here somewhere uh, where we actually exploit natural resources. Can we do it? Well, there's a lot, lot, number of methods. You know, some, I will show you a few examples from Africa, but they, they, can, they have been tested elsewhere too. We work, one is this push-pull where you know, here we don't use any nitrogen fertilizer. Null, zero. So that we don't need. And why? It's because we have some acrobat crop here, a permanent plant, this module, which actually produces it for the plants. Deep root is, is, is there all the time. It works. Over here, and it works even better because it kills even the weeds. And also it has another system built in that it will deal with the bugs too at the same time. And so what happens here that because we have a complex system, we can actually deal not only basically with sort of the cover crop, which uh, suppresses all the weeds, the striga, which is a parasitic weed, but those plants here will attract the beneficial insects and repel the pests, which then will go around the field in, in sort of a trap crop here, so all the borers are out of the field. And you know what? If we use hybrid maize varieties, the system doesn't work very well because the breeders over the years have actually lost some of the major traits of plants who are able to defend themselves. They have produced volatiles to basically repel uh, or, uh, uh, pests and attract beneficials too. But these hybrids have lost this ability. If you take farmers' old land races, which actually in that system produce as much as your hybrids, they again have added value because they can deal with pests and diseases. 
So you see the progress. I think we have gone, we have gone backwards because we tried to go forwards too fast. SRI, the system of rice intensification, is being used now in many other crops. TEF, who uh, people know, is an Ethiopian crop which produces, you know, if, every, if people have tried hard over the years, you can get maybe maximum 800 kilos per hectare. Really, but they have to work hard. The average is, I think, 300. In that system of SRI, three tons. No fertilizer included. It's to understand the system. It's to understand the, the capacity of certain crops. How do they grow? But if you just come with throwing fertilizer at it and maybe something else, chemicals, I mean, that's, it's easy. Sustainable agriculture is complicated. Biocontrol. I mean, I have to show this because that's what brings me here, actually, that wasp. Um, it works. It works from across Africa. How much is being done today? Oh, people will tell you, don't worry, GMO will solve the problem. So to do, that's too complicated. You have to rear bugs and release them and do things. All right, this is natural. It doesn't cost anything. So we can do all this. We, we, we have. And then the animals. I'm glad to hear that this used to be a barn, so I hope the cows who used to be in here are now right in the field somewhere. Because we need, you know, animals need to be on farm, not in factories. And uh, that's one big call of this report was said, get the animals out of those factories where we lose antibiotics. And why do we put them in factories and close together? Because we want cheap meat, which is unhealthy to begin with. So what are we doing here? You know? so, so we don't think enough. And what, the one thing we don't do, we don't think enough about how things are connected. How many people here are studying system dynamics? Good. So I think things will change. Because that's what we need. We need to think in systems. We need to think circular and not only uh, uh, think uh, linear. And I'm glad to hear this. I mean, I, um, I hope that a few people will come and work uh, at the Millennium Institute uh, in our systems work. And so we need to shift that thinking. But that's still too prevalent in too many places. So how can we actually move from one to the other? We also have, again, lost a lot of these varieties, as I said before, and our diet needs to change into something which is much more diverse so that the farmers also can have a diverse growing system. And we always lost crops. Why, why, why do we grow only five, six crops around the world, basically? And if possible, with very narrow genetic basis. Actually, for people promoting this, this is criminal because it takes only one bug, one disease, everything is gone. So, so again, you know, we need to, we, and we know a lot better. Potatoes, I mean, you can look at all kinds of these in, in Latin America, uh, amaranth. The question is, is that what you want to eat, or is it that? I mean, you, you, we can get, give the people yellow rice and three times a day and say, no, eat that stuff and shut up. Or we can actually do things a bit different and say, okay, well, you have carrots and spinach and potatoes and rice and other things. I think it's, 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 it's uh, very arrogant of some people here who say, oh, in Asia, why don't eat people eat just yellow rice and then they get their pro-vitamin A and that's it. While we here have nice plates with a lot of stuff on it. And what's the problem here? It's inequity. So we cannot continue to eat more and, and consume more and feed yellow rice to the rest of the world. We, have, we change our attitudes. And this one is the, the, shows you the footprint of what we do and what we eat. So like with the, the food pyramid. So um, if you look at the, the, on this side here, you have the environmental pyramid. So if you eat a lot of meat, it means a very big footprint. And down here, you have a low footprint if you eat vegetables. And I think so we, we have to move over and have a low footprint here and a larger here, if anything. So, so the way I think we need to change, to, we, we consume and uh, the Barilla company, you may know, this is an Italian pasta maker, and they have done a lot of work. They have a lot of interesting uh, material for anyone interested in nutrition to show you know, how we actually have to shift the way we consume in order to make sure that we have sustainable agriculture. So that's all connected, as we know, and since you're all in, uh, very good in system thinking, uh, you probably understand that very well, too. And it is actually happening somehow. 
this is now, can you see this is up there, it's like 2007, uh, 2013 in October 27th, and a U.S. newspaper. Uh, you know, if you go to supermarkets these days in the U.S., but in other places too, the aisle with vegetables is getting bigger, and they're removing some of the other stuff already. So that's a good sign. Question is, you know, are these actually good or bad vegetables? I mean, hopefully they're organic or at least from sustainable uh, agricultural system. But it should say that there is a change. But I think around the corner we have now a new danger coming. The danger is, oops, sorry, I need to go back here. Do you know what this is? This, this is pasta out of the 3D printer. And so you actually can eat it because it's, it's, it's real. And you can actually uh, have pizza too if you want to out of the printer. So the trend now is that this is a new push. Don't worry about, you know, growing all the stuff out there. We actually can just have some nutrients in cartridges, and then, you know, you have your starch, your, your uh, fiber, and your color, and your well, maybe what minerals, and then you push the button on a menu, like a Chinese menu on your I don't know, laptop or uh, iPhone or phone, and um, you go around the corner and pick up your plate out of the printer three minutes later. This is not, the, this is now, it's happening. So the question is, is that what we want? I mean, you, because, you know, I'm almost done. So, but uh, the, for, because if, if, we, if that's what we want, the world can be you know, simplified to the extreme. Okay, this is how it's going to look like. Maze from, from horizon you know, to, to horizon. Because you take the maze, you can take it apart, right? And you, then we reconstitute it according to whatever menu you order. So this is the trend in some areas. So I think people have to wake up because this is the Monsantos and the Syngentas, the Bayer, the Yara, and the others, ADM, uh, name it, big food companies, Cargill. That's what they like to see because so they can make a lot of money, they control what you eat, uh, and also they control the farmers. So anyone around you who wants to be farmer, you have to choose now what do you want. You know, would it be just growing maize for a company or actually growing food? Of to nourish and not feed the people. Now, can it be done? You know, can we do a different agriculture? Because that's the question. People say, ah, no, it's not enough. Organic, forget it, cannot feed the world. Uh, it's too expensive. All right. We did a big system models to, to do this for UNEP. So you can go to uh, uh, UNEP uh, report 2011, and you find an agricultural chapter, which actually I was the, the, the main author. And we modeled with very complex system model uh, what could happen. So to make it short, we, we use 0.1%, no, 0.16% of a global GDP into a green, to green the agriculture. The total was 2%, but we used all the money for in other sectors like transportation, tourism, uh, energy, etc. So agriculture was left with 0.16. That's about $140 billion a year in transforming agriculture. Baseline is 2011, then this is 2050. So green is to put 0.16% in green agriculture, but to do what I said before, what came out of the ag assessment. And, and business as usual is using more money to do the same stuff as we did. So green revolution agriculture type, okay? So if you look at what happened then in, by 2050 uh, versus 2011, production is up. Even the crop part is up. Employment is up. So we actually finally produce, need more people to do that type of agriculture. It's pretty cool. Soil quality is one third better. Why? Because we put organic matter in the soil. Uh, water use is reduced. Look at this. Huge amount. Because why? Because now we ca capture the water into the soil. It doesn't go on surface. And also it's available when it's a drought. Land. We use less land. The promoter of the Green Revolution said and wrote that if there were no Green Revolution, there would be not one tree standing in the world. Okay? That's Norman Bollock. You can read it in his uh, book. He also said that uh, Rachel Carson was the worst thing ever happened to agriculture, by the way. Um, deforestation reduced by 50%. Again, we don't need more forests to grow good food. And the calories are, are about uh, up a little bit from uh, today, look, by two and a half thousand, which is plenty enough. It can be done. We have the money for it, and we should do even more. 
because I don't think that 140 billion on a global scale is a lot of money in a world where we spend more than 380 billion dollars annually in subsidies to exactly promote the wrong type of agriculture. So what are we trying to do? So we're changing course. So we need to change course now. And so we have three countries where we are doing this and basically trying to, to move so from, 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 the, oh, sorry, from the, the national level here, so multi-stakeholder assessment. It's not only the Minister of Agriculture who does the work, it is everybody who is linked to agriculture, the private sector, uh, the farmers, farmers association, the development partners, then the, the government. They're all sitting around the table doing the model, analyzing agriculture, the food system, and then eventually putting numbers on it, play scenario. So how in Senegal, in Kenya, or Ethiopia, which are the three first countries to do this, can they transform agriculture toward this sustainable uh, model we are talking about? So, so we have uh, action at the uh, national level and then at the global level, CFS in Rome. They will pick up the results, uh, distill this thing, and provide support and guidance to all the other countries. And as you know, this will lead to partly also to these new sustainable development goals, which will be universal. They apply to Sweden, to Switzerland, to US, to everybody the same. So be ready. And I think you, you have a future here uh, 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 and good jobs to come. Now, how is this being done? So the trick is that you have to start somewhere. So basically, we start here with this multi-stakeholder discussion. Bring everybody in the room. So, all right, what, how is your agriculture working? And you start somewhere with production. And what is all connected? I'll show you a little picture afterwards. And then the, the, the people we train locally, the modelers, the system dynamicists, and the economists, uh, ecologists, all sit together and build the model and quantify it. Eventually, you, you have sort of discussion with, uh, again, multi-stakeholder to validate the model so it is actually working properly. And then you develop here the policies. Because people know, all right, we want by 2030, we want to produce so much, uh, that type of food. We want to have such a health status, uh, GDP or whatever. And then you go and implement those policies. You monitor, evaluate, and go back and feed in the system. Because the problem is when new policies need to be evaluated. Are they working, yes or not? If not, you change them. And so we're going to have a development spiral which keeps going around and getting bigger, bigger and better. But that's not the way it works today, you all know. And this is just sort of a quick thing, but that's sort of the, what we start with when we discuss with these multi-stakeholder meetings, uh, looking at, at the agriculture. If you look here, this is sort of the production, and you can see all what sort of influences it <coughs> as... Uh, uh, and, and that shows that things are much more complicated than just putting a seed in the ground and some water and some fertilizer and then here's the production. No, there's many, many, many more uh, uh, elements which impact it. And that's, we have to actually show this to the decision makers because they don't know. There's one guy over in finance, he decides tomorrow, oh no, we're going to put a, uh, we're going to import rice because um, we don't have enough maybe in the country. Um, and that's good because we need cheaper food for the people in the cities. All right, you import rice. What is the consequence of this? Is that the price collapses, um, the farmers, local farmers can sell their rice and they're all going bankrupt. And so you can look at the details and anyone who wants to know more about this can uh, write to me later on or look at our website. But this is basically sort of where we go. And then the difficulty really is to implement all this is how do we get the message to the farmer? You think that today we know how to do that. Maybe here it's easy. In many places in the world, it's very complicated. And then how do you actually make sure not only, you know, sort of the scientists here work away on their own and push stuff out. Actually, it has to be done on farm with farmers and then the message to go out and come back. So basically, we have to work really in this cycle where the knowledge is transferred from one side to the other and back. It's again, nothing is one way. Uh, street uh, in the world, but if you go and look, the reality actually even today is a lot of one-way uh, uh, business going on. And I think I'm out of time, so I will I'll leave it here and um, I'll open for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. There was certainly a lot of food for thought for us to deal with here. And please, questions to Hans. 
comments? Or critics, or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, first, uh, it, it was very interesting, uh, but I have a work, one question about the, you said some kind of quote, like, the more we grow here, I, I guess you mean Europe, the worse it is for other countries, like Latin America and Africa, something like that, because actually we should grow less here and less, let them grow there. But, uh, I mean, if we want to get food here, are we going to get it from there, like, should it be like more carbon emissions, more international trade, or I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, um, good question, because it needs a bit more elaboration. You know, you're never going to grow pineapples here, right, for example, or mangoes. And I think you, if you want to eat them, why not? So there will be a number of exchanges. But the politic of the EU today is actually to produce more milk than you can consume. What's going to happen with that one? All right, they're going to export it, they're going to dry it, make powder milk, it goes to Kenya. In Kenya, what happens? Farmers there produce milk, plenty, enough of the country. But some guys will, introduce, will import the milk because it's cheap, mix it with water, and sell it on the local market, undermining the local farmers. This is happening. You can go check. It's there. It happens daily. So what's happening in Europe, what you need to do here, you need to grow what you need. And you know the big discussion on protein production here versus buying the soybeans in Argentina and Brazil. This is really total nonsense. How can you even think of doing this, like taking away so much uh, nutrients from Latin America, bring them here, feed pigs and cows and animals, and nothing goes back to Argentina, nothing. It goes down to the bottom of the ocean. We know that in 150 years or less, the phosphate reserves will be finished. Are you going to go suck it up from the bottom of the ocean? So, you know, we can do things different. We don't need to. We can, we can grow proteins here too. All right, in the end, the meat will be more expensive. And then so be it. Because it is too cheap now. The people down in developing countries spend 50, 60, 70% of their income in food. You guys here, maybe 13%. In my own country, it's a mere 8%. People spend, spend more money on their cell phones every month than on food. You know, we got to be realistic. This cannot work. How long are we going to put the head in the sand? Okay, thank you for uh, your enlightening presentation. On your last slide, uh, you introduced your uh, communication program to farmers. Um, obviously, there will be more interest groups who want to communicate in their kind of way to the farmers. Uh, how do you make sure that you uh, that you be the first one or that you win this comp competition against Monsanto and Syngenta? Yeah, actually, if you look on the website of the Biovision for uh, Biovision.ch. Uh, you'll find something about this farmer communication program. And basically, we, we publish uh, now in several languages a magazine called The Organic Farmer or The Smart Farmer. I mean, there's different uh, ways. The magazine has different names, different countries. And um, exactly, that's the problem, because now we want to actually provide information to the farmers to do sustainable agriculture. We don't want Monsanto to make advertisement in there, right? But although they have the money, actually, they could carry this forward. So we have all these problems, you know, how do you provide uh, um, useful and sort of neutral information which is not forcing people to go into one, it basically in, into that wrong type of agriculture, uh, chemically-based agriculture. And um, so, again, they have their own network already. Don't worry. I mean, they're out there with their motorbikes selling uh, little bags of stuff. Um, but I think that what, that's why I think we need to find a better system, and that's where government has a real duty. They cannot continue to delegate agricultural research, agricultural extension, uh, all the information goes around it, databases, to the private sector. This is wrong. Private sector has a role to play in agriculture, yes. Transformation, and retail, there's many places where they can do. When it comes actually to the to the research, in particular when it goes to the to the the production itself, that's where I think they cannot delegate. Food is a human right. 
and you will never responsibly, if you're a government, to put a human right in the hands of a private sector. Well, why you invent the so again, to make sure that everybody gets information and not biased and not just the people who have money to reach the people, I think that's why we need to have again the civil society organizations and government. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question about how the farmers can. Um, the, the structure of the system is uh, that way that you get more money for uh, bigger yield. Uh, but uh, how can you make uh, the same amount of money if you produce less and uh, with your kind hmm. of principle? Uh, very glad you asked this question because I mean this is one thing I didn't touch before. Uh, you know, when I said food is too cheap, so farmers don't even have money, right? So they try to cut corners, they uh, uh, find means and ways to, to produce more with less, and that's always at the cost of something. And that's the cost of the ecosystem services. Um, that's you, so you, you cut corners, you put fertilizer rather than to your own compost and do things which are more complicated, and so you pollute the water. So you externalize. So basically the farmers, what they do today, they externalize a lot of those costs so they can actually compete in, in a market which is not fair. And in the end, I think that farmers need to, uh, to have to, a, a proper income and they should actually have a better income than people working in an office in a town because they take huge risks, it's hard work, and actually they are treated as the bottom of the society. I mean, almost everywhere, you know. I mean, so, but farmers, the farmer profession has to be lifted. And it can only be lifted, actually, if people understand the value of food. And if you understand the value of food, you are ready to pay for it, which means that you're going to have, again, more people interested in agriculture, more farmers doing it in a way which will protect uh, and their, their, their farms and for, for the future, not only just for today. And so... You don't have to always produce more to have more money. You have to produce better. And there are schemes. There are schemes where, where governments, you know those subsidies. I'm not saying that farmers don't need that money. They do need it. But they need to, it needs to be given in a different way. Not if you have, grow, have a bigger farm, you just have more hectares, you get more money. And we know that. I mean, in many countries, you just bigger farm. I mean, some farmers don't even work on the farm and get plenty of money because they have land. No. The system has to be, again, adapted to, to different country conditions. You cannot have the same system everywhere. In Switzerland, they actually they started to pay farmers subsidies on the basis of how much less fertilizer they use, uh, how many more species of flowers they have in their grasslands. So basically looking at you know, the sustainability issue and, and, and actually pay extra. But I think the best way forward is to change that system of pricing of food. Farmers should, should sell their food uh, at the price which covers their costs, provides a, a, a proper living, and not, not with all this subsidy business. There ought to be a way to, for economists, and I guess there's some people around here with ag economists, we are figuring that out. But figure out a way which can make this system fair. I mean, it's like the people, I don't know, the plumber, he doesn't get any subsidies, right? He makes a living, and many others. The lawyers and all these people, they have subsidies. So, so we need to use the same system there also. And the people in the city will have to pay for ecosystem services. They will have to start to pay for the water, which they can Because if the, fa the, the farmers make a mess out there with his nitrogen and uh, manure or whatever, somebody has to pay to clean the water, right? So why not you pay the farmers to have practices which don't pollute, for example? I mean, there are many ways I think you can do this, but it, it is wrong to always socialize the costs and basically privatize the, the, the profits, right? And that's exactly what's being done in many, many instances. And in agriculture, in our food prices, basically we have spread out all the costs of producing cheap food to everybody. And I think that people who consume should be responsible for themselves. So if they want to ruin their health, let them go to McDonald's and eat junk food. But they have to pay their own health care then. And not you, all of you will pay for those people. 
You know, so, so I think we have to rethink the system. And it will take something to do this. Not easy, but it has to be done. <clears throat> Hi, um, I was just wondering why you decided to choose Kenya, Ethiopia and, and Senegal as the first three countries to trial this out on. Uh, I'm sorry, I really did not hear this. Oh, word. Um, I have a microphone. Yeah. I was wondering why you chose Kenya, Ethiopia and Senegal as the first three countries to try the, trial this out on. Um, that's purely uh, done by because of the donors. You know, we, we're all, we don't have just free money. And the donor community, the Swiss government actually, IFAD in Rome, uh, the Mercator Foundation and another private foundation gave us some funding. And it's because of the countries, they, at least IFAD and the Swiss government who gave us the money to do this with those countries, uh, wanted these three countries to be in the, the game. But, um, you know, we were happy to go elsewhere. I, I, I wanted also to have a European country and in Latin America and Asia, but it wasn't possible. But it will come. So it's just purely because of the money issue. Right. Uh, beautiful talk. Fantastic. Um, just wondering, you know, many of the, uh, you were mentioning that people spend less and less on food. Sort of that's uh, deflate, food prices are deflated basically, but there's a lot of prices that are inflated, such as house, housing and stuff. So basically everything is out of sync, is out of wacko in that, in that sense. So it's, it's a bigger problem than that. Um, so in, in order for, for us to drive um, a, um, more bio um, uh, save uh, crop production i think we need also to subsidize maybe organic farming instead of uh, subsidizing over production is that a possible value a v v uh, venue for for driving organic mm -hmm. production because basically what i'm saying is that uh, well yes we spend too much maybe on s cell phones but we, but we also spend too much on housing and all that and uh, basically what we are left at the end of the day with is not that much that we can mm -hmm. spend on food. So maybe we, we need some uh, incentives or mm -hmm. to, to produ produce actually uh, safe food, uh, yeah. organic food. Actually, it's a good point also because, you know, we can think about why is it that organic or, you know, at least let's say sustainably produced food, okay, because there's a whole range of things there we can actually we will qualify. Uh, should be more expensive. And it's more expensive because the one thing is the certification. So here you have something good, and then you have to pay actually just to put a label on it. And over here we have stuff which ruins the environment, which has chemicals on it, which basically doesn't have anything written on it, and it's cheaper. It doesn't make sense, right? So I always thought that you know, we should force the other guys to label, okay, here I use so much nitrogen, which produce so much CO2, I did, did, and did. And people will start to look at those labels and hmm, maybe uh, that's better. Because still the costs come in then also, because all that has a cost. And people need to be better educated. I think the problem here is also a lack of, of uh, consumer education. And um, interesting, again, if you look, we, we have started a little project called Clever. So we go around with a container, which is like a mini supermarket, and people can buy. And they have to compete against some personalities, which like uh, Roger Federer and others who went to the store and to the little store and bought. And because you can choose meat or milk or butter or potatoes or tomatoes, you know, we come from different places and they have a footprint. And so you want to beat whoever, you know, has bought there before you. So this goes around in schools. You got to educate people when they buy, you know, what is the consequence of my buying this tomato versus that tomato? And um, in this, so I think people need to be better educated. You know, you know, this price difference is small in vegetables. If you buy organic, you pay what more? Maybe 20% or 20%? I don't know. It depends. Actually, in some places, it's the same price. The fact that you have 20% less water in most of these things, they will actually last longer on your shelf or in your fridge, uh, and they have more nutrients, so you eat less. You know, in the end, you spend the same money. Um, but, you know, should we subsidize organic? Well, why not? Until you find a better way of doing it. You know, I think we have to help it. We have to help this, this transformation, and uh, it may be different from country to country. But it's not good enough to have like 10% or 15% of your land in sustainable production. It has to be the other way around, 80%, 90%, actually it should be 100%, because we can in the longer term to, to do things in that way. Yeah, uh, you mentioned... Um 
something about cattle. I'm here. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Good. You mentioned something very briefly about cattle, and as I understood it, you meant that if we have if we have cattle or animals in our farming system, uh -huh. we can make it more sustainable than if we don't have it. Yeah. Could you please explain uh, what you mean? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, how we should eat no meat and, you know, cattle are all bad, uh, contribute to climate change and God knows what. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we have a lot of grasslands in the world. They need to be grazed. And uh, again, I think so that's where you need animals. Now you can debate should we then eat them or not? I mean, that's individual. Some people want meat, some don't want to eat meat. I'm not going to say we should all be vegetarian or vegans. Um, or that that's an individual choice. The problem is, I think, we should understand what is the consequence of doing this. And we also know that if you have a, crop, a proper crop rotation, which in sustainable agriculture or organic, it quite often actually should include a couple of years of, of a grassland, which could be grazed with, with legume grass mix. And that's sort of part of that five-year or four-year crop rotation. And so who's going to eat the grass if not cattle? Okay, so, so to me it looks like, and we know that from, from the system because we need to recycle also the, the nutrients in that system. So they are, they are very much part of a system. Um, again, they don't have to be everywhere all the time, but I think it depends where you are in the world again. I think it's very important. Think about some of the drier savanna of Africa. Oh, there's these three savannas. What would you do there if not graze animals, for example? And there's a lot, a lot of people, millions of people live in those zones. So they produce sheep and goats and, and they have cattle and even wildlife. So, and, and they have to be grazed in order to be maintained. Like in these results, we have to graze those, those areas. If not, we have lots of avalanches in the winter, etc. So again, there's, again, you can say maybe the deer should graze them and not our cattle. Well, fine. But um, I think it, it, in, in a sustainable system, uh, animals actually belong onto the farm. I mean, not that they have to be everywhere, but they don't belong in factories. This is, I think, the big difference, you know, sort of. But, yeah, people want cheap chicken, cheap pigs. I mean, look at the piggeries. I mean, this is a disaster from, a, from an animal, uh, uh, the way they treat those animals. Never mind, actually, you know, how... Uh, what, what, what they feed them. So, so now we have to come to our senses. We, we cannot continue to do things cheaper and cheaper, and that's basically where this comes from. <coughs> Hi there. I was um, your presentation yesterday. Um, you, we, you talked uh, with an archbishop about um, values, and I wanted to ask you a question in reference to this. Uh, you mentioned we should change the pricing system to cover fairly for costs of organic production and the cost of a dignified living, um, a wage, um, a revenue. But our goal in society is not to live in a dignified way, but to be materially rich, uh, beyond need, and influential beyond consensus. Um, what kind of inner changes in values uh, should we look for? Um, what kind of health, um, inner health, should we sort of aim to? Okay, now we start to uh, philosophy uh, <laughs> part of it. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of the ills of the world, I mean, uh, come from this, this inequity. I mean, we have a lot of conflicts in the world. And they are not oh, sure they end up to be around natural resources. But why do we actually fight for natural resources? Because some people have too many of them, they grab them, and others don't have anything. Africa is actually a very good example on how many governments from the West have gone down there. They maintain bad government in place for years and years so that you know, they just can take out all the minerals at, at a cheap price. We have built our wealth, I think, on the back of many other people, as you know. And I think, you know, sort of the little foreign aid we give to this country is, is a drop in the bucket, nothing. And then what we do, we try to even impose our own view of the way things are or should be, which is also wrong. I mean, you go to many places, people are very happy, but they don't have much, but they, 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 they even receive you, they will share their food with you, although they're very little. There's a the very, very different attitude. And I think this drive in many of the, of the developed countries or accumulating more and more, 
I mean, look at the numbers. Uh, there's, there's more and more richer and richer people. The middle class is being eroded, never mind what's even below. Even here, America has 42.5 million people who have not enough food. They live on food stamps. And what did government do? They cut the food stamps, right? I mean, so, and this is the America where you think everybody has a, uh, has a house and, uh, I don't know, two cars and a motorhome and something, you know, and a boat and everything. You know, that's sort of what we think. Well, you go and look, it's different. Uh, Europe has also almost the same number of people also in the 40 million which don't have enough money to buy food. So, yeah, who am I to say it should be more expensive? But well, at, at the same time, we need to have a more egalitarian type of society where people, that everybody has the same say. You go to Brussels now, there are hundreds and thousands of lobbyists, like in Washington, like in many capitals of the world. And who are these lobbyists? This is not the, well, okay, maybe farmer lobby, there's some also. Um, but these are the big, big companies who are trying to protect their interests in, in all the policies which are being developed. They actually, even worse, go and make the law. You all heard about the uh, revolving door business, and I mean, that's known. There's names you can actually list, and we know exactly who does what. The fact that Monsanto people have made all the, the, the regulation in the U.S. concerning the accreditation or the uh, authorization for GMOs uh, shows how corrupt the system is. And that's where, you know, we need to, to start to uh, wake up. And um, if democracy doesn't take over again, I mean, real democracy, I think we are playing in bad shape. And uh, I don't know how many people vote in Sweden when there's anything happening here. Uh, let's have to go to the polls, but in many, many countries, you know, half of the population doesn't bother. Okay, if they don't bother, some people will. And the wrong people actually take advantage of this. So... When you think how many years and hundreds of years people have fought for democracy and now they, life is good enough so they don't care. So you see, we, we, we need to revive some of these uh, uh, democratic principles which actually would, I think, change the system or help change the system. Because right now, why? It's just very simple. Organic is more expensive than the rest. It doesn't make sense. Because if you want to eat organic, you should be able to say, no, you want this to be supported. So, all right, tell the government you want this to support it, and not the large-scale uh, destructive type of agriculture, which now gets the money, as we know. So are people going down the street and making barricades or something, or are just sitting and waiting? I think we've become sort of a sheep-type society in many places. Hi. You said that the GMO or yellow rice is arrogant. Or can you please explain oh, that uh, how the total consumption will be less if people eat normal rice with all the vegetables rather than eating the yellow rice? Sorry, this is sort of an echo back here. You know, can you repeat? Yes, I was Sorry. just uh, wondering that how the total consumption will be less if people eat normal rice and vegetables and carrots, but if uh, the total consumption will be, uh, or the total consumption will be less if people eat only yellow rice or the GMO rice. But you know, people think that. Um, Poor people need to eat yellow rice because they have a lack of pro-vitamin uh, A, right? And uh, because they cannot afford vegetables who are expensive. So, well, let them eat rice. Well, uh, to me, this sounds like let them eat cake, you know, you know the thing, huh? So, and we know that it, with education, uh, it would be possible to make sure that the children who today don't have enough pro-vitamin B would have enough of it. And it doesn't take much. And again, for the agronomic system behind it, you want also a more diverse system and growing vegetables and rice and everything else. So to me, it looks like, you know, we need to, it's not that we don't want the children to be healthy, but certainly I don't, and many people out there don't think that just by putting something now in the rice will solve the problem. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a top-down, uh, arrogant, uh, manner of, of trying to solve a, a, a huge problem. A vitamin A uh, uh, deficiency is a big problem. But if we had done our homework already long ago, I think we would be talking about uh, vitamin uh, A rise uh, today. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I hope I did. 
Thank you very much. And we have time for one last question over there. Yeah, it is it's very bad. Okay, now it's on. Oh, no. You mentioned a bit companies as Monsanto and Syngenta. And I was thinking, how do you suggest that we work against a development where a lot of big companies get a big influence on the food market, like they try to patent different genes on living organisms and uh, all the kind of things that they do? How can we work against that and that they try to get less and less cultivars of all our crops? Well, you know, a few years ago, that was probably before you were born, um, Nestle almost went bust. Nestle used to make, uh, still make, uh, uh, baby milk. And, you know, that created a huge problem in, in, in many developing countries because children were dying from all of the, the, the area because people were using dirty water to mix with the milk. And they would have this huge campaign, you know, against breastfeeding. Anyway, people are in the developed world start to say, what's going on here? And they started to boycott Nestle products. It almost killed the company. And today, many companies are very worried about consumers' behavior. And I can tell you, if you want to see, you decide that Monsanto is no good, or Syngenta, or Bayer, or Yara, or whatever, you can just say, okay, I don't buy anything which I know has any connection to these people. And I think that's what consumers need to be more aware. Okay, what is it? Who has fought the, the GMO labeling in the U.S.? The major food companies. So then you wonder why people are not actually getting up against them. And it's sort of interesting that Kellogg, for example, who makes uh, the cereals who many people eat at breakfast all over the place, actually has, a, has an organic brand. So actually many companies, you know, they, they are, I don't know, they, they are dishonest in some ways uh, that uh, they do sell organic because they can see this as a market, but overall they're still supporting basically your traditional stuff. And, and millions and millions and millions of dollars have been spent by all kinds of companies. And some of the people who were supporting the labeling actually start to check who is paying for what for the, to be against the labeling. Quite amazing, the list. All right, we have a list. Then we can say, all right, oh, this is frito -Lay? I don't buy. Uh, this is what? I don't buy. You know, this is the consumer actually can control. It. Now, not 100% because there's stuff in there. You don't always know exactly where it comes from. But the big brands like to put their name on the stuff, and that's what I think you can do. So, so you can, on the one hand, demand that it is transparent, you know where does it come from, who is behind it, and the other one is to say, I just don't buy if I don't know. Or if, it, if I know, and I can then be selective and say, I'm going to don't buy that. Thank you very much. And... Uh... It's uh, interesting to be here, even if it's just a few kilometers from Lund, it is uh, sometimes uh, another world. Uh, we'll see how we can bridge the, the, the two worlds. Um, I, would, I will talk about politics of agroecology, or we, I will also, I added us another title, which I will explain later, which is In Search of a Rural Modernity. So some of the questions that were raised towards the end, how can we how can we actually change systems, will probably be addressed here. There might not be so many solutions, but at least if we, under, if we believe that understanding the problem is part of solving it, there might be uh, a small step in that direction of understanding why it's so hard to change. So, modernity. A rural modernity is actually an oxymoron, to some extent, because modernity is sort of the, the period or the kind of society that has evolved along with the Industrial Re Revolution. So modernity in sociology and, and, and political science and so forth is sort of the society we live in which is characterized by uh, industry, urbanity, globality. A society that is centered in cities, it's global and it's based upon industry. In modernity, rural areas don't really matter much. They are supposed to deliver the natural resources, they are supposed to deliver the food and take care of the waste. But apart from that, rural areas are not that important in the traditional modernity. So therefore, we think that we need to put rural areas and agriculture into a new modernity. A rural modernity. 
If somebody wants to have a very vivid and exciting understanding of how modernity um, unfolded, particularly in the United States, 1930s, read Grapes of Wrath by uh, John Steinbeck. It's an absolutely beautiful description, uh, an epic description of how modernity affected the rural areas. Um, I read it as a young man many years ago, and I reread it three years ago, and it was the best reread I've ever done. So we need to rethink that a rural modernity can actually address some of the problems we have in urban areas as well. So to make a very long and complicated story very, very short, modernity, people left the rural areas in the beginning of the 20th century because they could find jobs in the cities. The agriculture mechanized, that was a mechanization and an incredible increase in the efficiency of agriculture that freed up labor. And there were booming industries, factories in the cities that could absorb, that needed labor. Today, the situation is very, very different. We have, I mean, our country, sort of Sweden, is, what is it, 80% living in, 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 in urban areas. But in most of, of the global south, there is a very, very rapid urbanization going on. And the cities do not demand any more laborers. There is unemployment, very high unemployment in the megacities. You go to any megacity in, in Africa, South Asia, unemployment is the most pressing social problem. Um, and the cities cannot really accommodate more people. Some cities, I, I, uh, I read somewhere that Dar es Salaam is growing at 8 to 10 percent annually. How can any organized development keep pace with that kind of influx of, of, of people? So we need, which is, I was very, very glad that Hans, wherever you are, uh, stressed sort of we need to create jobs. We can't see rural areas as a place where we mechanize, where we make everything more efficient because we need jobs in the world. And rural areas can, we can create jobs in rural areas if we rethink agriculture. And that can be combined with increasing quality of the food we, we, we produce. So here I would like to introduce the concept of food regimes, which comes out of a, uh, the discussion of political ecology. Um, Harriet Friedman, I think, was the one who coined it in the late 1970s, and which is very important because to understand that we, can just, we can't just pick and choose and combine modes of production in agriculture in what way we think is best. But they, came, they come as packages. So food regime. So this is a, a recent paper by Eric Holt Gimenez, uh, who um, identified four food regimes, current food, food, food regimes, uh, which then sort of, um, so you have the, the neoliberal uh, food regime, and then he talks about, okay, what is the main catch word? It's food enterprise. Um, and who are the main institutions driving this regime? And then you can have sort of the reformist, which is still sort of part of what he calls the corporate food regime. And then you can have food movements. And so you can have a sort of, a, a, um, this is the most, this is business as usual, or perhaps even worse than business as usual. And this is sort of a more radical, where we talk about food sovereignty rather than, than food security or food and, 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 and enterprise, who is, which is driven by social movements. So food regimes is a very important concept when we're trying to understand why things are as they are. So here I will just uh, uh, address a, um, very, very quickly uh, a question whether food regimes can coexist. Do we have to have one food regime dominating or can we actually have coexistence of food regimes? So uh, the business as usual, I think we can call it the productionist paradigm which is focused on output, high input monoculture, quantity over quality, labor productivity over land productivity, limitless resources in terms of energy, for example, and nutrients. Health is not really an issue. It's a fairly good description of 
the one we have. Then there is another one, which is called, uh, we, we could call the life sciences integrated paradigm, or in a more political terms, we would perhaps call it an ecological modernization paradigm, what, how an e ecological uh, modernization uh, scholar would describe agriculture. So it's science-led integration of the supply chain. It's capital-intensive in use of life sciences. It's industrial scale. It's intensive use of biological resources. So they realize that resources are not limitless. There are but we can produce, we can invent new resources through biology. For example, if we run out of fossil fuel, we can grow the fuel we need on our, in our agriculture. And there are novel but unproven health impacts. And then we have a third, ecological integrated paradigm, which I think is, what's happening here? I press some button. Um, okay, which is something that we perhaps can see emerging. And I think I would course, position Hans in this one, where we talk about risk minimization and ecological pr approach and diversity, which very much speaks to the language of contemporary sociology, the work by uh, one of the most eminent uh, sociologists today, Ulrich Beck, who talked about the risk society, that we are creating a society that might be more and more efficient, but we are increasing the risk, all kinds of risks are increasing with this. And that's what we are doing in agriculture, so therefore a risk minimization strategy. Um, it's a whole farm systems approach. It's organic food to become mainstream. So organic food should not be something for the rich urban elite, but it should be something that we all eat. Um, resources are finite, and we can probably not just produce whatever resources we need. We have to keep sort of our production within certain limits and their explicit focus on, 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 on health. So this is definitely what, what, what Hans has talked about. And then the question, can they coexist? And I think it is politically and ecologically naive to think that they can coexist. Um, when the Yastad was presented, about the same time, there was a British um, report called Foresight presented. And the message from that one was that mm, we don't have to be choose that or sort of one over the other. We need all. We need GMOs. We need organic. We need sort of something in between. We need all these resources and all these paradigms. Let all the flowers flower. I think it's politically and ecologically naive. So from a, um, I will give some sort of political, economical reasons why I think it's political naive. So we have food security. Who drives the agenda on food security? Food security is sort of something that is very high on the agenda. Um, in Africa, it is very much a concept that has been taken up by the initiative AGRA, a Green Alliance um, uh, for Af Africa. Um, and it is portrayed as the way out of poverty, the way to solve the world. Um, and with it comes sort of this kind of conglomerate of of actors. Um, so this is, I would like to say, it's, it's the strategy for opening up Africa for the biotechnology. Africa is still stubborn, lagging behind. The food crisis in Africa is used as a very important, very effective excuse to actually move in into Africa. And this is a major problem in this whole thing, is that the economic operations here are not based upon what we would like to see is a competitive capitalism. A kind of capitalism where actors compete with each other to satisfy the needs out there in society. But it's a clearly a sign of what we call a monopolistic capitalism, where the consolidation has gone so far 
that there is no competition among actors, there is a collaboration among actors, a few actors, a handful. This shows the main seed companies and chemical, uh, um, agrochemical companies in the world and all the subsidies they own. So there's a handful of companies. And so this is what, what we call a monopolistic capitalism, where they don't compete with each other to satisfy the needs out there, but they are creating the needs themselves. Creating the needs in order to boost their own business. A clear example is that if you start to look more closely into the, these, Syngenta and Monsanto, what kind of companies are they? Most people would think that they produce seeds. They're in the seed business. But that's only very recently. They are chemical companies. They are agrochemical companies from the very beginning. And the fact that they have went into the seed business is primarily this because that is a way to, if you produce the seeds, if you design the seeds, then you can sell more of your chemicals. So it's not what we would like to see, a fair competition among actors to satisfy the needs out there, but a deliberate attempt to create and design the demands. It doesn't stop with the production level. If you look at the other end of the food chain, we see a similar enormous consolidation of interest. So here are a few, a handful of companies, and he, these are all the brands they own. And there are probably new brands coming every, every day. So again, we see an, an incredible tendency for a shift from a competitive capitalism to a monopolistic capitalism. And we all know, even mainstream economists know, that monop monopolies are bad. Monopolies are bad for capitalism. The problem is that many people say that public monopolies, they are bad. They should be, they, they should be sort of um, uh, dismantled. And most of, of the people who, who sort of claim that we should dismantle public monopolies, they have no problems with the private monopolies. But the main difference is, of course, that a public monopoly can always be changed through democratic decisions, elections, and so forth. If we don't like them, if they don't, 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 don't behave. But private monopolies cannot be changed that way. So at the same time, we see this incredible consolidation. And it's only one sector in the world where the consolidation is as, has gone as far as in the food uh, sector. You know what that is? That's computers and internet. It's the only other area where you have where you have an even higher degree of consolidation into the hands of a few. So, I think it's naive, econ politically, economically naive, to think that we can have coexisting food, food, food regimes. Because this process of consolidation is so strong and it will prevent any, any alternative. The explicit strategy of the big seed companies is to buy up seed companies that produce alternative seeds, organic foods, or organic seeds, to remove the competition, to either close them down or to get the patents, or no, not the patent, but get the knowledge, turn that knowledge into a patent that they can make, make, make use of. Uh, ecologically, this shows uh, from a recent paper in Nature the growth of superweeds, uh, weeds that are resistant to um, at least one or, in many cases, multiple herbicides. Oop, I was pressing the wrong one. Let me see. Okay. Um, glyphosate is this one. And Roundup Ready types of crop, they have been manufactured with the argument that we can, re we can reduce the amount of herbicides, we can re uh, reduce the amount of, of pesticide we spray with these, uh, these, these new crops. The, it's actually, it was 90, late 90s, this is exactly the area when, and glyphosate has been around for quite some time, and it was about this time, I think the 1990, 
seven, six, something, some of you might know better, that was when we had the first uh, glyphosate-resistant um, seeds uh, on, on, the, on the market. That's when we see a rapid increase in the... So this is now 25 number of weeds that are resistant to, to glyphosate. And it is... It's this. So these kinds of systems, here is the ecological reason why we can't have coexisting regimes. If you say that organic farmers promoting pollination services, for example, on their field, they produce a co-benefit for everybody else in the landscape. Because the bees or the, 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 the butterflies, they do not just stay on that farm. They actually fly to other farms as well. So you produce actually a co-benefit to others. And here you actually have, you produce a disservice to others. When you use sort of these technologies, nobody can really protect themselves from uh, the, or if you have sort of genes that are spread. Anyone who is interested to understand how this industry operates should read this, this book. Written by a sociologist and, and a political scientist. It's a long very, um, they have worked for many years as ethnographers inside the seed industry, the NGOs, and the government regu regulators. It's a very effective book. It's very balanced. It is not arguing. It, it doesn't sort of tell you what to think. It tells you something that's going on, and it's up to you with your sort of intelligent mind to decide on what side you are. And I think it will be difficult for somebody to actually read the book and decide, yes, we want this life science integrated approach. One story, I don't know how much time do I have? Okay, wonderful. Um, when the gene... So the GM technology was first discovered, Berkeley, it was a collaboration between Berkeley and Columbia University, I think, uh, back in the 1970s. There were strong resistance against it because people thought this might be dangerous. Um, originally, it was sort of the danger not so much for the production or the products that would come out because that was still seen sort of into the future, but it was the danger for the lab people working with it. So there were health concerns. Uh, widely published and debated in, in journals like Nature and Science. Uh, but then uh, the product started to come out of it, and um, Reagan became president. So early 80s, uh, Reagan administration thought, oh, wonderful, here is a new, new sector, a new technology that we can use to actually expand uh, the... Uh, American science and tech, tech technology. So he said to industry, you don't need any regulation. You will sort out that your, your, yourself. Uh, with very important sources, they show the industry responded to the administration and said, no, we want regulation. So why did the industry want reg regulation? Uh, two reasons. The first reason was that it will be easier to convince the public that it is healthy or harmless if the government is behind it. If it has gone through some kind of government approval, it will be easier to, to, um, to, uh, to, to market and convince people because they realized from the very beginning that people will be skeptical about it. The second reason was it will protect the industry from liability if there are problems. You know, in the US, you can be sued. Ask the tobacco in, 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 the industry, in the industry. They have paid billions and billions of dollars because they have caused lung cancer. So the shrewd strategy was that we want government approval of our technology because that would protect us if there are lawsuits against that, us for causing cancer, disease, and so forth. And they got the reg regulation they wanted. They got a regulation that they can control, but it is a government regulation, so the industry is free to do whatever they like. It's scary reading. So, food sovereignty, the other food regime towards the right here, which is a very radical idea, completely different mindset. First of all, it's based upon the idea that 
people should be allowed to choose what to eat. The diet we have shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be sort of dictated by either government, the World Bank, or the transnational companies. Communities and farmers should be able, allowed to decide what we are going to grow and what we like to eat. Food sovereignty, in a, in a rural modernity, as we think, this is a very, I mean, I mean sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, you have to go back to the sort of old sources to find the, the really, really good sources. Here is a diagram um, that you can read about in a classical book by Robert McNetting, anthropologist who wrote the book in the early 90s, Small Holders, Householders. It's a beautiful book about, he has worked all over the world and trying to look, sort of understand um, agricultural systems and how they op op operate. So in this diagram, he plots the output per hectare versus the output per worker. Well, and here we have, we have Taiwan is the extreme case. You have Japan, Egypt, you have Netherlands here. Uh, it's probably excluded some, some, and it comes from a, a classical other study of the 1970s. So it's, it's sort of before the GMO. And then on this side here, New Zealand, Australia, United States, and Canada. So in this direction, that's the kind of traditional intensification or modernization we have seen, where you increased output per worker, this will free up labor. It will free up laborers to work in industries. Or you can also say it creates unemployment. But you can also, of course, have movement where you try to do this, where you try to increase the output per hectare instead. That is, of course, a real problem under modernity as we know it. It will lead to two minutes. Okay, it will lead to what uh, anthropologists and some economists have realized: it's the problem of involution. That you invest so much in the land that prevents you from changing technologies changing, uh, so prevents you from adopting new wonderful technologies. And that is, of course, a problem in the conventional modernity. But in a rural modernity, that's exactly what we want. We want to have a labor-intensive, high-quality food production system. And to f end with, my favorite farming system in the world in this is what's called the Candian Gardens of Sri Lanka, a threatened agroecosystem. It's very densely populated, so they have little space. What do you do if you have little space in the x, y, uh, sort of this direction? You increase your area in this direction. So instead of just growing things on the ground, you grow high trees, low trees, bushes, field crops, root crops, vines, you can produce enormous, an enormous diversity of, of things on a very small plot. It's like an oasis in, the, in, in, um, um, in deserts. They have lots of space, but they have very little water and very small areas where they can actually produce something. Then they produce sort of vertically instead of um, um, hori hori horizontally. And the good thing with this one it is almost impossible to mechanize. So it will create jobs. And the products that come out of it, fruits, nuts, very, very high value products that will actually be able to maintain a labor intensive agriculture. And it takes a lot of knowledge and experience. So we're not talking about creating some kind of rural proletariat to do sort of sugarcane harvesting or something like that. We're talking about highly skilled laborers that are needed to maintain such system. But the tragedy is that they are disappearing very, very, very.
rapidly. The World Bank has a scheme where they are promoting rubber plantation instead, and many of the Canyon Gardens have been transformed into rubber plantations, where you have seasonal workers working on almost slave contracts to do the rubber tapping certain periods of, 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 the, of the year with no security the rest of the mess. So that means that I will just <laughs> say that there is a seed of hope. Um, I forgot this. Uh, who is another Right Livelihood Award laureate? Wes Jackson, who is building an agricultural system where he goes against all conventional wisdom that he wants to create a perennial versus annual, polyculture versus monoculture, and he wants to maximize the genetic diversity in the field rather than minimize it. I think it is the ho or one of the most promising hopes there is um, because we can't fight sort of the conventional food, food regime uh, if we don't have a really good system to compete with. So, sorry Thank for you. Um, welcome everyone on behalf of Luxus, one of the Right Livelihood Colleges, the Right Livelihood College in Sweden actually. Um, it's actually been our privilege over the last few years to be able to host the Right Livelihood Laureates here in Lund and in Alnap as well. And really for us it's an opportunity to actually get some of the sustainability soldiers who are in the trenches to come and share some of their words with us. But it's also the chance to have a bit of a conversation with them. And so that's what we'd like to do now is to be able to really open up a bit more, have some thoughts from them, but thoughts from yourselves as the audience as well, comments, questions that you'd have. Unfortunately, we do have to end at 12 o'clock, so we're going to cut this a bit short, but there's certainly time for your input, so I'd hope you think about it. And I'm going to take the chair's privilege and start off with my first question. Um, I'd like to come back to our three panelists, to the topic of the seminar, which is the future of sustainable agriculture and food systems in 2050. That's 30 Six, 37 years from now, so less than four decades from now. And going with what Chuck has said about embracing future visioning, I'd like to ask the three of you to share with me what you think would be one scenario of where we would be with agriculture and food systems in 2050. Your thoughts or one picture of where you see we would be. Do these work? Um, they should work, yes. <laughs> so where will we be in 2030? 50. Or 2050? I give you a few more years. <laughs> okay, all right. That's uh, <laughs> it's good because it's much more fuzzy, so we don't have to be too specific, I guess. Well, for a lot of the people in the audience there, <laughs> here, it's actually not too far away, so um, it's where their careers are going to be. It's actually interesting that, uh, you know, when we did this uh, ISTAD report, uh, we were supposed to look 50 years backwards and 50 years forward. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that the looking backwards was fairly easy, right? Because, I mean, just go and uh, check and read things. Um, the present was a bit more complicated already because not everybody agreed on the definition of where we are today. So that was actually one of the problems. And, and then it made it very difficult to look 50 years down the road because that was supposed to do. We to, the report was supposed to give us sort of a, a roadmap to go to, um, forward for the next 50 years, solving the problems of today and, you know, being better off. And I, I showed you, as you said, well, where do we want to be? And then do the back casting. Um, we actually, if you read the report, you'll see that there's very little about the future. And um, I thought that was actually because we, there were not enough young people in the, in, among the authors to actually be concerned about what's going to happen in 50 years. You know, we, we <laughs> shouldn't be concerned too much because we won't be around or okay, our children, I guess. Uh, so that is actually a very difficult thing to, to figure out this. And we, didn't have, we, don't, we did not have the, the models, which actually we have today, a few years later, to help us sort of... Uh, play out a number of scenarios mm -hmm. because we, we know where we want to be, but then how you get there? And thanks, you mentioned that also. You know, how, what is the road? There's many roads to go to Rome. Question is on which one you want to be. But I think that we, as far as I, I, I would say, you know, where are we going to be in 2050? 
uh, we have to be, we're going to have to be in a different place than today. I mean, that's <laughs> the one thing I think sure we, we, we know and we can say. Um, I'm pretty sure that because of the pressure on agriculture uh, from climate change in particular, but also demand from consumers, because there's the change, as you saw also on one of the slides, I think we will move toward a, a more sustainable system. And I think it's, it, it's almost by force, I think, by in some ways on the road, that we will have to, to make that change. So again, I'm very optimistic that I think that uh, the movement will go in the right direction, because uh, there will be a wake-up call, uh, there will be more disasters coming, and um, I, I, I have faith in the human in humans that uh, I think they will make take the right turn uh, uh, soon. So I think we know where we need to be. Uh, we know also the road we need to be on, um, and we need. We also know that we need to fight. I think some of those uh, major uh, forces, which I call almost evil out there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that we will land in the right place where we have to be. Leonard, can I ask you to be a bit more descriptive of where, what you think that future looks like? <laughs> oh, I, I think I, I'd, I'd line it out. We need a more, a more uh, diverse agriculture, uh, which is uh, based on smallholder farms and family farms, and agriculture which actually where, where it mines its own future. Mm. And uh, that is actually the basis of sustainable agriculture, or call it organic, call it uh, conservation, but not the conservation with herbicide, but the conservation where we actually try to do things in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sustainable manner, so which means that, the, and I think the definition was there this morning, that we leave basically the place in, in, in the same or better condition for the future. Mm. And I would say that we should actually leave it in a, in, a, in a better condition, and we know how to do it, and I think we can do it. So diverse, localized, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, looking at not only the production of crops, but the production also the, the development of ecosystem services which will help you know, the positive cycle as we move forward. Um, also, an agriculture actually which maybe a, which will is localized not in the sense that we don't feel that you know a few countries because they are endowed by with the land or the climate that they have to produce food for others, but I think that, that a place a world where you'll see the communities never, wherever they are produce at least most of their uh, basic food needs. Thank you, Hans. <clears throat> Okay, um, there's one important driver of change. I think that we, we haven't uh, fully grasped it, and that's climate change. Uh, when the uh, new IPC assessment will come out, the work group two in March next year, there will be uh, one very important message, and that is that heat waves, heat stress, will become an incredible strong driver of change. And it is also the compelling evidence that sort of the, the modern varieties, well fertilized and, and sort of uh, uh, optimized for efficiency, they are the most vulnerable varieties to this new kind of situation. So climate change, and especially the cocktail of drought and heat stress, the conventional wisdom was that drought is the main driver, sort of water stress is the main driver. But now there are compelling evidence that actually heat is a stronger, heat stress is a stronger driver. And if there's one thing that IPCC is certain about, and that is the most thing, uh, the most certain, uh, the highest certainty is that the number of heat waves, the frequency, the length, the intensity of heat wave will increase and they use the strongest possible word, namely virtually certain about this when we talk about 2050. So we'll have a completely different environment to grow things in. This will probably force, unfortunately, would force a more sustainable agriculture on us. It would be so much better if we deliberately, in a planned way, adopted this. But the current way of that, that, that agriculture is governed, we are driving full speed into this wall. 
Um, and that is sort of scary. Mm -hmm. But I, so I believe that 2050 there will be a more sustainable agriculture, but we have been forced to adopt it very, very abruptly with lots of suffering on poor people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you ask us to vision. I think the future farming and food system will be highly biodiverse. It will be locally based. People will be more in touch with their food, where it comes from and why it's produced the way it is. It will be equitable so that people can be fed. It will not be as wasteful as today's system. It will be much more based on plants. Uh, and I think we have no choice in the long term than to do these things. What Thank planet you, do you come from? <laughs> <laughs> not Nebraska. <right? laughs> Doesn't sound like Nebraska, does it? <laughs> Give me a little change there, too. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I think I'm, I'm happy to hear that they are generally optimistic, even though you see that the road to get there is going to be a pretty tough one, I think, with a lot of um, forcing from the outside. Um, but I also see that reaching that is going to take a vision of getting there from, from this audience of people who are deeply involved in agroecology and other parts of sustainability studies. Um, and so I'd like to ask you in the audience if you would like to ask questions about that road, about the process of getting there, or really anything about the three presentations that have been held before that you'd like to raise. Lots of hands up. So I'll start at the top. And if I could ask you to please just stand up so that the three panelists can see who's talking. Thank you. Uh, yes, good day. My name is Lynn. I'm from the agroecology uh, program. I would like to thank you for all of your presentations today. It's been really interesting. Uh, so we all have know that we have identified this need for a change. Um, this ESTAD report has come out that has told our uh, politicians that we need a change. Uh, our vice councillor of SLU has uh, Googled sustainability. And we, we all know this. Um, but for example, this day today, Agroecology Day, it's only one day. Um, where agroecology is presented to the agronomy students that is studying uh, agriculture for the whole year. So my question is, uh, how do we go from words to action? Big question. From words to action. I think each of us starts in our own homes, um, which we do. Unlike other Nebraskans, we have one small car. I bicycle to work, take the bus if it's icy. We have a big garden in our backyard. Uh, we keep our temperature low in the uh, winter. Um, we have no air conditioning. Yeah, we do the things that we can do, and I think in a way we are living in the future and modeling the kind of behavior that uh, others should think about. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's important to say that we, we have different skills and talents, and we have to do what we are best at. So, but one incredible inspiration is to look at the Right Livelihood Award laureates. Hans talked about the guy who started the uh, resistance against breast milk replacement, and Fasal, who was uh, one of the early Right Livelihood um, laureates. He started his campaign as an individual, and by now I think he has started, what is it, almost a thousand different campaigns to that. Um, another Right Livelihood um, award laureate was Percy and Louise Schmeiser, who were normal, convention, no, not conventional, normal organic farmers in Canada, and they were uh, they were visited by the gene police from a particular company. I won't mention the name, and they stood up and they fought for ten years with incredible courage, um, putting all sort of the farm um, as a, as a, um, um, uh, yeah to get loans. Oh and actually fighting a legal battle, and after 10 years, they won, and now campaigning to starting. So we have to do whatever we are good at, but to be informed by sort of a good case and inspired by role models. And look at the Right Livelihood Award. The homepage is full of role models. Thank you, Leonard, for that plug for Livelihoods. <laughs> Hans. 
Yeah, I think uh, the change starts by yourself. I mean, that's that's true, and I think uh, our agreement, colleague here, exactly. You know, you you cannot sort of go preach what you don't do yourself. And so, I have a little uh, farm and I have a little organic vineyard. So whatever I know, I'm, I have many things to do. So I'm not there very often, but just that shows that you know, I, I live also by what I preach. And I think that's very important for every one of us. That's that that's the the first thing. But I think also we need to. Um, work much more so with the media. I think we have to try to pass the message out. I mean, there are a lot of people out there, you know, it's amazing the ignorance, actually. Amazing. How many people really know what the GMO is, you know? I mean, they, they read a little bit here and there. Information, actually, is very bad. And I always think when, when I read the papers, I happen to know something about what, what I'm reading and I see how bad it is. So what, what about all the rest I don't know anything about? And, and I think it, it's important that everyone also starts to, to, to be active in, in, in correcting the message out there. So, uh, because, yeah, I think we, we cannot continue to deal with this ignorance because ignorance actually is a, a big problem and will actually pull us down if we don't fight it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My question is about um, a trend that I see in agriculture right now. So, sorry. Yeah. So, both here in Sweden and other places in the world, there's a big push for biofuel crops to be grown, of course, to increase energy sustainability. And I was just wondering what you thought about how that fits into the ideas we've been talking about today about a sustainable farm. Thank you. Coming from Nebraska, I can say biofuels are a disaster, in my opinion. I would not say that to a group of Nebraska farmers because they might not have a job, but it's really a very inefficient way to try and power ourselves. We should think about conservation of energy, looking for other alternatives, and use food for eating instead of for ethanol. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a, that's bio, produce, bio, to produce biofuel is short term thinking. Right. No, no, no. And actually, I don't think there's a single biofuel who would be uh, commercially feasible if it were not subsidized. So basically, why do we do things which are bankrupt from day one? You know, it, it is totally useless. And I think like in Germany, where they grow corn with fertilizer and even pesticides to put it to, uh, to make biogas. I mean, come on, you know, how, how dumb can this be? You know, it's, it's crazy. Because also what we do, we use water. We use non-renewable resources to produce this, to produce it, and actually at a cost. I mean, in ethanol, it costs more calories than you get out of it. Again, so you know, let's say if a farmer would, would keep a little piece of his, his or her farm to produce the biodiesel for their tractor or their whatever machinery they may use, that that actually would be a, a different thing. But if you produce biofuels to, to run trucks to produce to transport stuff which doesn't need to be transported or SUVs out there, I think really we have to ask ourselves what we are doing. Well, I think it's a it's a, it's a mistake to put all the blame on biofuel. I think the main reason, the the root problem, is the internal combustion engine. We are still dependent on a technology that has only about 25% efficiency. 75% of the energy put into an internal combustion engine is just lost. Right. So as long as we are dependent on a technology that is so wasteful and needs these fuels, we will be, have very, very diff great difficulties to get away from it. So therefore, we need to change the technology that demands these, these biofuels. Okay. Then I think we can be successful in, 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 in promoting more sustainable use of our land. I think important points around the logics of our systems and how they work. Um, there's, yeah. Um, I had like uh, a common understanding in the panel. I think it was like like short term pessimistic because the the, the trends like uh, it, the meat consumption is increasing, the lab grabbing, the globalization of food. For example, in here, yeah, Sweden. They don't grow coffee, but they drink a lot of coffee, for example. And that, that's something that, in, in case, if it has to do something, it increases. Now, mangoes come from Brazil, for example. And we have them all year long, and that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's true, and it's increasing. Mm -hmm. So that we would say, like, we are short-term pessimistic, but somehow you all agree at this, like, 
in the long term, in 2050, will be good. Like, <laughs> it will be a change in the midterm that it will suddenly will change the trend. But I still don't see that, and I don't see quite clear how it's going to happen. And yeah, are we put enough? It's like it's that a temporal myopia that we have. Like, okay, someone else will do it for us in the future. I don't know. Do you see the, the moment of the change? Well, are, are you doubting yourself? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you, you are the ones who are going to go out and do it, right? So I, I thought that what we can do here is only sort of tell you about our experience and maybe our, uh, what, what we, from our experience, may think you know, the direction will be or should be. Um, clearly, uh, you are the next generation, and, and you are the ones actually like, transform this. So... Uh, Again, I don't know how many people here believe in agroecology or in sustainable agriculture versus maybe the big tractors, which are sort of on the drive, I guess. But, you know, so I'm not sure where you all come from uh, uh, in, 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 in that sense. But uh, uh, why I'm optimistic, if not, if I, if I, if, you know, if I were, if I didn't think there's any hope, I would probably be on my vineyard and drink my wine and be happy. <laughs> uh, okay. I wouldn't be traveling the world and go to all this trouble of flying and making a mess out of the <laughs> air and my footprint is actually not so good as you probably realize. But because I think that by, by talking and by helping and you know, passing on the message, things will change. But in particular, that's why I spend time here because I think that's the, the most useful time spent is actually with the next generation and, and have a dialogue, a discussion uh, to, to forward. So, so I trust that you will actually do what needs to be done uh, like we did in the past, uh, and, and try it. Because, when it, because why do we talk about what we are about agroecology? It's because our generation actually worked out there hard to make sure that this comes forward. So now we are passing on the baton to the next. But also, I think change will happen. It's absolutely inevitable. But the problem is, how does it happen? And 2050, 2070... Most of the crops we grow today will be out of, they will be, they will perform extremely badly. We need to have a change driven by this sort of cocktail of increasing droughts and heat stress. The problem is, can we do this in a kind of proactive way, in a graceful way, or will it happen through almost something that somebody would call Malthusian traps? disasters and food crisis that will necessitate it. So hopefully we can do it in a more graceful way than this. But change is inevitable because it is completely unsustainable the way we do it. And particular by 2070, 2050, 2070. So. You saw a picture of Wes Jackson from the Land Institute a few minutes ago up here and someone asked Wes once during the, one of our board meetings with him, Wes, how can you be optimistic when everything is so negative around you and you're working on this 100-year research agenda? He said, well, is there any alternative to that? I think Wes Jackson is also a wise man. Uh, we have time for one last question. <clears throat> The land master students. Okay. Okay. Well, look, we have time for one last question. You have had the opportunity to ask <laughs> questions yesterday and today. I hope you won't mind if we give the floor to them. Great. So, I, so land master students, because I don't know who you are. <laughs> ah, the front row. <laughs> would you like the opportunity to ask a question, or would you like to take your question afterwards? You also have that space to do it. And one brave soul has decided to put up his hand. We can go on 15 minutes more. I've been told we can't. Uh, 15 more. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, can we take the question as we're running out? Of... No? Okay. I, I would love to suggest that the two of you talk after we finish the session. Uh, we have a time, you're all here, so conversations don't just have to happen with them. They can happen between you. Um, okay, I, I'll try to be as land-oriented as I can in my question. <laughs> um, I would like to know, you know, the general trend in, in finding a career and looking uh, towards the future um, is, is to increase one's status. Um, and I feel that if you want to become a farmer today, um, that doesn't quite match that trend. So my question is, how, how can we render the... Uh, profession of being a farmer a lot more attractive and integrate it with with a knowledge information society a technological society how how can the academia perhaps help that what is the academia ready to do um, to, to be able to to make this profession dignified and uh, really valued in society if you were to be a farmer what would you like society and the academia to do for you. Thank you. I think you have a good example in Italy. Slow food movement is one very interesting sort of phenomenon in society that will actually uh, create sort of a different value of food with consequences for how it's, how it's produced. Um, the important thing is that these sort of qualitative movements they need to be they need to be to, to, to expand they, they shouldn't just be sort of the the urban well educated elite uh, I think uh, food is very much a class question unfortunately so uh, this question actually goes right into the middle of of social struggles it's a class question First of all, academia needs to um, uh, put agriculture as one very, very important part of the knowledge in society. So why do we have in Sweden a system where we have an agricultural system that is under the Ministry of Agriculture and we have other universities that are under the Ministry of Education, creating sort of this kind of rift between one particular sector and rest? It's absolutely stupid to say the least. Agriculture needs to be part of the general knowledge production. Thank you, Leonard. I've been trying to negotiate and I think we have 10 minutes extra. Okay, because we have a, a very real structural concern that some of them have to go to the airport straight after this. So 10 minutes means that we can take a few more questions um, and the floor is yours. Um, is it on? Yeah. Um, my question is, it's more like a comment, a critical comment, because when we talk about sustainability, I think the biggest problem is that sustainability includes a kind of long-term perspective, and it's not only distance in terms of um, time, but also in space. So we who are already here, we are concerned about sustainability. We are already thinking about it. But what about those people who are not concerned about it? I think we need to create awareness. We need to create a kind of critical mass in order to get this out. Because I think psychological studies, they show that people don't think longer than in a five years perspective, but we think about 2050 or something. And you talked about this, the consumers, the responsibility, and I think we need to teach people to take responsibility for their actions. But the problem is, what is the right key? So I think if we show things on TV, like people in crisis somewhere in Africa, it doesn't help at all because it's so far away from our own life. But we need to find channels how to get people like a personal attachment to this to see okay what is going to happen to me actually if I, if I continue living like this but I haven't found the key for this but I was wondering if you know anything about this I mean I think a good option could be to make green something like cool because at the moment the image of green is not really I think something which people desire for so I think we need to find a channel and maybe as you said the media to make green more like a cool, like a cool movement that people follow these kind of steps. And I was wondering if you know about any approaches or anything like this, how we can make those things more attractive to the larger mass. 
So I'm sure the panelists would all agree with that comment. Do you have any suggestions on making things cool? Well, uh, you know, people spend, I mean, the young people and the others, I guess, spend hours, I mean, a, a day or even uh, so, yeah, hours per day playing computer games. And I always thought that maybe we could actually make really smart games, you know, not only people killing each other or jumping over, I don't know what, but somehow use you know, all the stuff they already have to make games which are actually real. And we tried this, actually, because the Millennium Institute, we do the system models, so I tried to get some companies interested in our models to make real, uh, like a, for a country, basically, you, you could have Sweden, and we, we can model Sweden, and then you can play games. You can be the prime minister or whatever you have here, or the king or whoever makes their decisions, and uh, say, all right, what will happen if I do this? Because that's what you want to know. You want to know what happens 25 years, 50 years, if I do something today. Or, and that is possible. So basically, the, the stuff we do at Millennium Institute, the games for governments, they, they could be put on a, on a thing for everybody to play. So that would be one way, I think, to make people aware. Okay, what happens if I do this or that? Because people are not aware, they continue to do the same thing, and you can see, oh, if I do the same thing for the next 10 years, oh my gosh, health will be disastrous, our environment will be, I don't know what, water polluter, whatever. So, so you have the indicators, because we have very good indicators already on, on, on many, many different uh, uh, um, things that really happen, many different factors. So the question is, how do we get them to the people? And maybe to have something which is attractive, attractive games uh, would be the way to do. But it's actually difficult, because we tried one, and we couldn't find sort of a way to make it really nice. It's what's called shadow government, and it was basically you could play the be the president of the United States. And we thought the game would be ready before the election. It wasn't That's something to strive complicated. For? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we can, any country, it doesn't matter where, you can do it for anyone, any country, or any sector, actually. We did the one on malaria, for example, for Rio. It was the Rio game. You could play real-time reality. Uh, so that, that's now reality government, not reality some, you know, TV show things which have no sense or it doesn't make much sense but you actually could be playing the prime minister of a country and see what happens mm -hmm. i'll come back to the education theme just for a moment i think it's all about challenging what you hear challenging your professors instructors challenging yourself challenging your own paradigms why do i think the way i think why does this instructor present a certain point of view where are they coming from if you figure out some of these why questions, then we can look at, you know, other possibilities and start thinking outside the box, so to speak. Um, so learn to challenge. It may not be socially correct or, or very comfortable sometimes, but you should be challenging us. Where are we coming from anyway? I think we can't just reduce people to coolness searches. I, I think that's to, 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 to reduce ourselves too much. I think there are um, people are more profound than that. Um, yesterday we had this meeting with the bishop in, 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 in the church. I think that there are two incredibly important social forces sort of deciding or influencing who we are, what we do, and, and how we behave. It's religion and popular culture. Uh, working through social forces and trying to get sort of the message out through various... Um, uh, channels, I think it's extremely important. Uh, coolness might appeal to some, but many people are more profound than just searching for coolness, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. And also, if you, if and there are studies, if you go out and ask people, what would you like, what kind of society would you like for your grandchildren? You get an incredible list of sustainability. Nobody talks about that they would like their grandchildren to have the sort of the hottest games, uh, the high salary, and things like that. They would say that I would like my grandchildren to have um, a community to live in, a healthy environment, the water, the air. They would have security in terms of, of, of where they live and so forth. So we think much more long term, but there is an economic system in between us that sort of forces us or doing everything they can for us to act 
against the more long-term thinking we actually have. So a grand, grandchildren perspective, I think, is extremely important to have. And I think most people have it. Yeah, but, but that economic system is our, our system also. So yeah. you cannot blame it on somebody else because we actually make it yeah. and we develop it, right? Yeah. So, so it's... But, the, but, the, but if, but if we just there go... is a system because we are that system. Yeah, but if we just think about making this cool, we actually become victim of the popular culture because it's so much easier to make un-environmentally friendly things cool than do the environmental things cool. But I think your, your comment was very valid, that it's about communication and awareness. That is something that we still need to work on. Uh, one last question. Okay, hi. This is going to be a very concrete question. In Lund, we have a discount grocery store with a billboard which says, if you pay the regular price for your food, you pay too much. If you had the chance to place a second billboard underneath, uh, which catchy phrase would you place there? <laughs> Good question. If you pay regular price okay. for your food, you pay too much. I would just say, you know, pay less today, pay more tomorrow. <laughs> Distinguish between... <laughs> yeah. Learn to distinguish between a green campaign and a greenwash campaign. Superficial greening of products or Walmarts or whoever is not really greening. So you have to dig into it, figure out what this company or this product is really doing. Chuck, reminding us to challenge ourselves and ask why. Yeah. I would ditch the question, but it's interesting to note that one of the most sacred principles in environmental economics, the polluter pays principle, is inverted when it comes to food, which you alluded to. Great. Thank you very much, audience, for the questions. Um, I'm, I'm, I know that we're running out of time, but I would like to ask you if you have one last thought or comment you'd like to share before we close off this panel discussion. You've already made quite a few, so it's okay if we save time and you don't actually uh, have anything more to add at this point. I heard some catchy stuff last spring. It said too many of the decision makers are pale, male, and stale. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Um, I, I have to <laughs> I must say when I was asked to be when I was asked to chair this panel I did sit there and think oh no another panel of old white men <laughs> here's the token young female <laughs> I would my, my, my take on this is use your democratic rights yeah I have sort of sensed that there are different camps in the room. And I think this is very problematic if we, our education system, create camps that do not uh, communicate. So uh, I would wish our education system would be more sort of uh, based on, on, on dialogues rather than creating camps. Because we need to solve problems immediately, but to make sure that these short-term solutions of becoming the enemies of the long term. Thank you. And I think that this venue has created a platform for all of you who are here, clearly have some common interests around that. I hope that the conversations do continue once our panelists have left the floor. And on that note, I think we will end the panel discussion and yes, hand back to right. you. Thank you very much, audience. Thank you, panelists. Thank you.